In 1813, the author of The Age We Live In, a fragment dedicated to every young lady of fashion, articulated the growing tension over the relative importance of health versus beauty, writing, quote, I scarcely know which is the worst, whether to have one's health or one's beauty injured, for I'm sure the former is of very little consequence in this world without the latter. Indeed, I cannot fancy a more distressing situation than that of knowing yourself to be the ugliest person in the room, end quote. This privileging of aesthetics over corporeal soundness was an important aspect of the debates over fashionable life. And by the 1830s, health and activity were deemed vulgar, while languid and listless ladies sporting pale complexions were all the rage. So widespread and accepted was the popularity for illness that it was even mentioned in Tate's Edinburgh Magazine um, as part of the debate over the Great Reform Act as um, uh, evidence of the bill's necessity. Um, as a reason or a way to break the hold of, quote, people of fashion. It stated, who ever heard of a woman of fashion wearing the hue of health upon her cheeks? Why, it would be the death of her pretensions. As the appearance of poor health became increasingly fashionable, the illness chosen as the model for emulation was the disease consumption, what we now call tuberculosis in part because beauty was believed to be one of the significant signs of a predisposition to the illness. So beauty actually becomes almost a diagnostic marker for tuberculosis. For instance, the monthly magazines, Accounts of Disease in London, stressed a connection between a consumptive countenance and, quote, a physiognomy that is in general, especially in females, more than commonly interesting and attractive. It went on to assert that beauty is allied to tysis, which is again another term in this period for tuberculosis. And that, quote, the qualities which it is delightful to contemplate, it is not always desirable to possess. Those exquisite charms touch on the confine of disease. So during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, cultural ideas about beauty intertwined with the disease process of tuberculosis to allow the ravages of the illness to be presented in an aesthetically pleasing light. Tuberculosis then becomes a site of conflict, a battle between both professional and popular ideologies of disease, a conflict that actually plays out in beauty practices and dress. Now, observation and experience had led medical investigators to conclude that an individual bearing certain characteristics was more likely to suffer from tuberculosis than another who lacked those qualities. As a result, many saw certain physical attributes as the indication of those individuals most likely to come down with the disease or those who were hereditarily predisposed, rather than as the actual symptoms of the illness itself. It was believed that consumption was the product of a flawed constitution, and the predisposition to the illness um, was a, an inherited flaw, um, one that could be activated by a number of exciting causes. Now, Charlotte Bronte, the one you might be most familiar with, the Brontes is a family sort of afflicted most tragically by consumption, um, is one that is really despite the fact that four of her siblings in 1849 had already passed from the disease, and the fact that her sister Anne was still dying of it in that moment, Charlotte Bronte, who had real personal knowledge of what a death from consumption wrote, consumption, I'm aware, is a flattering malady. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, seeing somebody who is actually having first-hand experience with that and still buying into this idea of it being aesthetically pleasing um, is really what sort of made me wander down this path. Now, consumption seemed to enhance its victim by a, a sort of amplifying those qualities that were already established as attractive. For instance, the idea that white skin and rosy cheeks and red lips were attractive was a notion of long-standing dominance in advice and instruction manuals. These same qualities were actually characteristic hallmarks of the consumptive disease process, which gave you a pallor and a rosy complexion caused by a hectic flush, the product of a low-grade fever. Now, medical references to the symptoms repeatedly described the body as thin, slight, delicate, slender in make, with a narrow chest, projecting clavicles, and shoulder blades that gave the appearance of wings. The complexion was called fine and delicate, with a clear, smooth, nearly transparent 
complexion, a skin of an almost brilliant whiteness. That whiteness was only relieved by the bloom of the rose, the result of that low-grade fever. And the pale translucence of the skin made the veins particularly prominent. The face um, was sort of complemented by wide, sparkling, dilated eyes, um, again, the result of that low-grade fever. Um, the medical references also speak to having white teeth, um, dilated pupils, and fringed, dark, luxurious eyelashes. And these are the medical descriptions of the disease, not ones in beauty manuals. Now, as descriptions of the ideal feminine form in the 19th century tend to bear a striking similarity um, to those provided by tuberculosis, the accounts of these symptoms um, provide a glimpse as to why this disease beautified as it destroyed. As Roland East wrote in 1842 in his The Two Dangerous Diseases in, of England, Consumption and Apoplexy, there's only two that are dangerous, apparently. Um, he wrote, quote, some of the most interesting specimens of personal female beauty may be seen in consumption. This disease frequently seems to throw an ethereal character over the human form. The transparent skin without a blemish, with the blush, too often the fatal blush, forming a beautiful though melancholy contrast. The eyes, brilliant yet mild, the flowing and glossy hair, all form peculiar indications of the disease. Death seems to array the tomb, the victim for the tomb with all the attributes of physical loveliness. Now when we take these sort of medical descriptions and we combine them with early Victorian ideas of beauty, the sort of connection becomes a bit more clear. So early Victorian ideas of beauty are heavily influenced by a concept called sentimentalism, which advocated the idea that emotional authenticity was not revealed through overt demonstration, but rather was confirmed through subtle exterior signs and subdued behavior. The notion of sensibility was central to this ideology and reflected the ability of the nervous system to not only accept sensation, but also to convey the will of the body. Sensibility defined not only personal feelings and emotions, but also the physical manifestations of those sentiments. So for instance, a woman's pallor or her blushes gave insight into her emotional state. They were taken as evidence of the intensibility or the intensity of this sensibility. Beauty then increasingly becomes both moral and personal. And the exterior for sentimentalists reveals the interior beneath. Medical investigators contributed to this dialogue pretty seriously. Um, they actually believed that beauty and goodness were not only related, but that beauty was the external sign of a woman's internal character. The more beautiful a woman, the better the person she was. The physiologist Alexander Walker, for instance, argued that, quote, goodness and beauty in women will accordingly be found to bear a strict relation to one another, and the latter will not be seen, will always be seen to be an external sign of the former. So with the physical symptoms of tuberculosis being sort of a, a manifestation of beauty, this disease could now be rationalized as re reflecting its victim's moral virtue. And consumptive women were increasingly presented as both too good and too beautiful to live. For instance, clinical lectures on pulmonary consumption stated that, quote, we may often observe in families that the members in whom the hereditary tendency is most apt to betray itself are those characterized by a refinement of feeling and a delicacy of sentiment. Selfishness and hardness of character less frequently present themselves in persons susceptible of this form of disease. The common expression, too good to live, may so far have a foundation. And the poet may be justified in his exclamation that the good die first, end quote. So because true beauty came from within, the body of a beautiful woman was charming because it revealed her soul. And the face, which was considered the most transparent part of the body, or the index of the mind, permitted access to the woman's feelings as revealed in her smile, her complexion, and even in her eyes. So consumption, which provided exterior beauty as a result of an inherent internal constitution, tightened the bonds between the internal workings of the body and the exterior manifestations of those sentiments or those circumstances. For instance, in 1825, the most popular beauty book of the age, The Art of Beauty, um, 
demonstrated a conscious acceptance that consumption was one sure path to attractiveness, stating that, quote, there are some diseases, hectic fever, for instance, and again, this is another term for consumption in this period, uh, which greatly improves the beauty of particular complexions. In such cases, even the physician who knows it is the indication of fatal disease cannot force himself to think that the face is not beautiful, is not improved in beauty, end quote. Now, you'll be happy to know that the art of beauty also recognized less deadly ways uh, to achieve this goal. And the art of beauty is, is one of many, many sort of examples of periodical literature, um, as well as beauty publications that offered a variety of artificial means for achieving a look that occurred naturally in a person suffering from consumption. For instance, um, although these works did continually reiterate that cosmetics, the artificial means in question, um, should be used with a restrained hand and could only mimic nature. They could not create something that was not there. Now, since in sentimentalism, the eyes uh, were styled as the windows of the soul, um, and this is my favorite. This is actually a, um, a fashion plate from the 1840s, from 1846, um, the new monthly Belle Assemblée. She's, she's lovely. I think she's lovely, but I work on consumption, so, you know. I'm a little skewed, a little biased. Um, so the eyes were the windows of the soul, and they were thought to sort of reveal emotions, but also enhance beauty. Now, large pupils in particular had persisted as the defining characteristic of female beauty, um, and it was readily acknowledged by physicians as well as popular authors that this, quote, mark of beauty was rarely connected with robust or general health, and in some instances was a decided indication of bodily weakness. Now, one work detailing the markers for the tubercular constitution stated that the most consistent indicator of those predisposed to the disease were, quote, that the pupils of the eyes are uncommonly large and full, the eyelashes are long and glossy. Now, this was a medical treatise, and this is a description from a medical treatise, and this medical author then went on to offer some options for those who did not naturally have this state. Uh, the author um, went on to advocate a method for achieving this look if one lacked a consumptive constitution, calling for the use of belladonna to enlarge the pupil to a wonderful degree. Now, popular works of advice um, promoted endless lists of cosmetics to darken the lashes and to even draw on the blue veins that were so prominent in those suffering from consumption. Now, the whiteness of the complexion was thought to be sort of enhanced by the contrast of the blue veins that were thought almost to be a marbled effect, uh, that the faint tinge of blue gave delicacy to the white and mingled with the carnation. Fashionable women often used cosmetic enhancements to achieve this look, and in 1830, the Mirror of the Graces railed at the practice, um, complaining that women were drawing, quote, the meandering vein through the fictitious alabaster with as fictitious a dye. There was also a recognition of the limitations of cosmetics, that they could not create what was not already there, but could only assist nature. Now, one particular cosmetic seemed to raise the most ire, and that is the use of white paints. Um, these were very often advertised as pearl white and wielded to give an extremely white complexion, and they were almost universally condemned. Um, they were also thought to bring about tuberculosis in those who used them to emulate that look. Um, works concerned with fashion argued that these white paints, which were made from extracts of bismuth, lead, and tin, so not entirely he healthy, as you can imagine, um, they believed that they were capable of penetrating through the pores of the skin to act on the lungs and to induce disease. Now, fashionable literature labeled them, quote, death in the pot. But medical treatises, including treatises on tuberculosis, uh, vehemently asserted that, quote, the chemicals of the toilette very materially assist the messenger of death. Now, despite these warnings, the centrality of the complexion uh, to beauty meant that cosmetics remained an important, if controversial, definitely controversial, um, element of the lady's toilette. There's also a growing tension uh, between sentimentalist views that what was observed upon the exterior of a woman was a pure representation of what lay beneath, um, and the, the use of cosmetics to perhaps create something that wasn't there, right? There was an inherent kind of concern that cosmetic use was basically an attempt to make up for an underlying deficiency in a woman's character. 
Um, and we begin to see uh, numerous diatribes against, um, and this is one of my favorites, uh, numerous diatribes against artifice in both dress and the toilet. For instance, the young woman's own book in 1840 called it both unsuccessful and sinful. Um, and before the onslaught of such criticism, makeup be be begins to go underground. It becomes ever more furtive. Still there, but really, really um, quietly so. Um, still present, not proclaimed. And we begin to see um, issues like this. We begin to see offerings. Um, beauty writers begin to provide recipes based on socially desirable characteristics rather than on the use of actual cosmetics. So for instance, this, the center one is Mrs. King's The Toilette, which is put out in 1830. And what um, you can't see, unfortunately, is because I couldn't get a good picture of it, is each one of those little boxes flips up. And underneath, it says, innocence is the best white paint. Cheerfulness is your lip salve. So these are all sort of moral ways to enhance your beauty rather than um, artificial means, right? So we begin to see sort of a, a large number of these. So innocence is your best white paint and modesty is your best rouge, according to Mrs. King. Now the outcry against the overt use of cosmetics served to elevate beauty as something natural to a woman of virtue. And as a result, tuberculosis, with its ability to enhance attractiveness without deception or artifice, became one way of manifesting a virtuous character as well as naturally achieving beauty. Now, sentimental beauty takes more than just the face into account. It actually takes the appearance of the body as a whole um, to be an expression of her character, and clothing would play a significant um, role in the shaping of this character. For instance, one author remarked that graceful movement and unaffected elegance of demeanor is to the figure what sense and sweetness is, are to the eyes. It is the soul looking out. It is what the poet has called the thought of the body. It was clear what was expected of women. Softness, delicacy, weakness, and modesty, combined with a small waist and curving shoulders. Um, if one recalls some of the symptoms of consumption, a remarkable similarity begins to, or continues to exist between these descriptions of both beauty and disease. For instance, Dr. Thomas Graham's Modern Domestic Medicine described the visible signs of the consumptive constitution. It said, the brilliant whiteness of the skin, the bright redness of the cheeks, the narrowness of the chest, the projecting or winged conformation of the shoulders, and the slenderness of the limbs and trunk. Dress as a fine art acknowledged that these were features were integral to beauty in the, f in the female form. Now on the whole, in the 1840s, um, sentimental dress as we're gonna kind of call it, um, the fashionable woman was more demure than she had been and less dynamic than she had been in the decades previous. Um, her, face was, her form was slender, her face was pale and free of cosmetics, while her dress was relatively inconspicuous. Now the constrictive forms of sentimental dress, and they are quite restrictive, um, of the 1840s were not an effort to distort or disguise a woman's body, although they certainly did distort the body. Um, instead, the dress was designed to reveal the feelings of the woman who wore it. So uh, over here we'll have the, the 1830s, um, sort of a romantic style, and we're going to see this movement into the sort of height of the consumptive chic in the 1840s. Now, the main effect of this new style of dress in the 1840s um, was a limitation of movement. Um, the dress becomes increasingly tight and close-fitting. Um, in addition to this, the extended bodice begins to be ornamented in a manner heightened to sort of heighten the appearance of length. So we can see here this is an evening sort of presentation here. Um, for instance, the pleated fabric overlays that had been a feature of decoration in the 1830s were by the 1840s being sort of put on an exaggerated diagonal in an effort to highlight and narrow the shoulders and emphasize and elongate the waist. Heavy corseting made the upper body appear delicate and thin and weak in a manner reminiscent of the consumptive torso. Um, this is my favorite. As you can see, these ladies are not moving very quickly uh, or going anywhere very fast. Um, the bodices are going to simplify, and they become increasingly close-fitting, producing sloping lines that focus downward. The armhole is actually now cut very low off the shoulder um, and set with very tight, tight sleeves. Um, the practical result of this is that women could not lift their arms above a right angle, um, and so they're forced into sort of a stooped posture, and they were not really able to move 
move uh, very much at all. Now, the drop shouldered style also forces a round shouldered conformation and in doing so emulates the physical silhouette of the consumptive female. Sentimental dress also emphasizes delicacy and restricts movement and gesture just as the illness did. In sentimental dress on the whole, and so this is a corset from the 1830s, so that if you think back to that romantic style we just looked at, a little bit wider, that sort of a narrow waist, but sort of more free and wider across the torso. So this is a, a romantic corset. We're gonna move into the 1840s corsets. On the whole, the 1840s corsets are focused not just on slimming the waist, but on slimming the torso as a whole. So this is actually, a sentimental corset. It's incredibly like well-boned and well-armored. Um, although this is on a very upright mannequin, um, we actually put a replica on a human being and it forces your shoulder blades to pop up and above the um, top of the corset. So you get that replica of that or that forcing of the wing-backed appearance. Um, and it also kind of puts pressure over and so it's going to help enhance that um, stoop and round-shouldered um, conformation. Now, these corsets are incredibly important for providing the slimming of the torso that we see really in the 1840s. And the corset remained an indispensable and acknowledged component of style. Um, it was the essential instrument by which women could achieve this look. As sentimental fashions were believed to um, produce consumption and not just emulate them. So physicians took this up and they're incredibly furious about the wearing of corsets, particularly this style. There have been diatribes against corsets before, but it, they really ramp up in the 1840s in particular. Um, and the physical distortion caused by corseting is actually a vitally important link to the disease as deformities of the chest were actually um, commonly ranked among the exciting causes of consumption. Now, despite voluminous writings against the subject, and there certainly were, and so these are some more of the sort of examples of trying to get women to give up their corsets. Um, and this is actually a, a pathological specimen um, of a woman who was known in the 19th century to have corseted heavily. So it, it does cause some long-term um, conformational changes, as you can see. Uh, now, despite voluminous writings against uh, the use of the corsets, many um, accepted that women were, women were really unwilling to give up this essential item of dress. Uh, and young women continued to garb themselves in clothing that was thought to be ruinous to their health. Much to the frustration and anger of Dr. Francis Cook, who railed in 1842, he said, the compression of the uh, to which the dress of young females subjects the chest is a most frequent cause of pulmonary disease. It is, however, vain to expect that the warning voice of the physician will be listened to in preference to the dictates of fashion. Now, health made easy for young people in 1845 um, also asserted that consumption would be the inevitable result for those women whose chests were, quote, bound up to make them look pretty and considered the practice to be, quote, monstrous. Now, despite the ser serious proliferation of anti-corset works, um, not only did the practice continue, but sentimental dress as a whole was accorded positive values. For instance, in 1848, the world of fashion said, the female attire of the present day is perhaps in as satisfactory a state as the advocates of nature and simplicity can desire. The head is left to its natural size, the skin to its native purity, the waist at its proper region. The dress is one calculated to bring out the natural beauties of the person. So even as corsets were accused of creating disease, they also emulated certain features of consumption by import imparting sort of a physical confirmation that was the same as that produced by the illness. So that corset I showed you earlier, that eight sentimental corset, this is that corset opened up and laid down. And what you may not be able to see in this lighting, um, I'm gonna put some boxes around it, but you can actually see the wear patterns on this corset, which really show where the, the maximum amount of pressure is being applied. And we are generally seeing it here, which is pushing up on the upper back. Um, they're quite tight here. Um, it's gonna pop the clavicles up. They've actually done a repair and put um, a soft leather band along the top. And again, once we put this on, on a person, um, we found that it does actually pop the shoulder blades up above the corset. Uh, the waist is quite narrow and tight. And then we'll also see quite a bit of wear pattern on the bottom, which would have tilted the hips forward which gives us this, you can see sort of the pressures that would have been exerted. And these are the fashion plates. This gives you a sense of how these sort of 
slumpy, stooped women are actually, oops, sorry, I talked in my hand, look what happens. Um, the slumpy, stooped women are really sort of, th this is not, it is an exaggeration because it's a fashion of late, but it's not that much of an exaggeration, um, which is really quite interesting. Now, the corset and form of dress, as I said, sort of um, created this stooped posture, um, a posture that was natural in women uh, who had consumption, and one that was actually believed to create the disease. So that stooping was actually thought to be something that could cause consumption. Now, commentaries, principally on those diseases of females, which are constitutional, and that's certainly a mouthful, um, denoted the overall demeanor and posture indicative of the early symptoms of tuberculosis. It said, there is a degree of feebleness and stooping observed in the gait. As the illness progressed, the mode of walking is peculiar, being attended by stooping, weakness, and caution. Stooping was actually presented as both the architect and indicator of tuberculosis, and women's education was actually one target of blame. A physician's advice for the prevention and cure of consumption argued that the education of young women um, created the ideal environment for consumption to develop. It said that the inactive and sedentary mode of life appears to dispose to the formation of tubercles by the habit of stooping, hurting the lungs in the same manner with the malformation of the chest. Similarly, Henry Deschon in his Cold and Consumption in 1847 said, the sickly schoolgirl with her pallid countenance and stooping gait would seem to predict her fate, pulmonary disease. So by the mid-century, after the 1840s, consumption would gradually lose its positive associations. And when those positive associations are broken, so too is the connection to fashion. But if we think about the idea of sentimental culture as a whole, um, and we think about disease as character illuminating, it is easy to see how tuberculosis could invade popular ideas of beauty and fashion. Tuberculosis then was a death adorned in a masquerade of beauty. Thank you so much.